Thanks for joining us. My name is Jim Lachance, and I work with a group of researchers and farmers here in Pennsylvania who are interested in uh, cover crop mixtures. Today we're going to share with you a bit uh, from our research over the last few years working with cover crop mixtures and share and how uh, to use mixtures to achieve multiple goals on the farm. So today you'll be hearing from the four of us in this photo here. Um, and then we'll uh, wrap it up with some Q&A with the team that Alice just described. And so first we thought it'd be good to start off with our guidelines and kind of our four key takeaways for working with cover crop mixtures. Uh, first for weeds, um, this is kind of the key take home and Mitch will be talking about this. Um, we think you should have one to two species that provide fast ground cover in the fall and then add species to achieve other goals. Then for insects, Jermaine will be talking about this. To support beneficial insects for pollination or biological control, manage mi mixtures to include flowers. Charlie will be talking to you about managing nitrogen. Um, we think that combined, you should combine a well-adapted legume with a low seeding rate of a winter hardy grass or brassica. And kind of the overall take home point is that when you're working with cover crop mixtures, you want to aim for a balanced biomass from all the different species in the mix. And that'll help to ensure that you get a benefit um, from a range of different functions that each of the species has to offer. And so we'll revisit these guidelines um, later in the talk, but I just wanted to give you an idea of, of where we were heading. And so uh, when we started working with cover crop mixtures, um, we realized and started talking to farmers, um, we realized that a lot of what farmers were already doing aligned with some of the research that was already out there. Now, um, <clears throat> this figure that I'm showing you here is from natural grasslands research with uh, perennials and perennial systems, um, but this was kind of what helped us to think that our idea of working with cover crop mixtures would be uh, somewhat, somewhat similar. Um, and so you see on the horizontal axis the number of species in the field, and then on the y-axis, the vertical axis, you see the function. And so we'll be talking about function uh, a lot today. But what we mean by that is just the benefits or that thing that you want to get from your field on your farm. And so this y-axis ranges from low to high amount of the function. And so just to give you a few examples of what we're talking about and what we'll go into in, in this presentation is uh, plant biomass is a function that we'd be looking at from your field. You can think of that as yield or the amount of cover crop biomass that you have out there. Um, we're also going to talk about weed suppression, beneficial insects, nitrogen retention, and nitrogen supply. And so uh, when we're thinking about mixtures, what we were hoping to achieve is to, to really realize as many of those different functions as we can uh, by using a mixture. And so we thought cover crops were a good place to, um, to work with multiple species and to add species into the field uh, because, you know, in, in most of our rotations, we focus on one species, so we fall here at this yellow circle on the figure. And you see you get a certain amount of function there, kind of mid-level, but as we add species into our, our cover crop mixture and into our rotation, we hope that we can get more functions out of the field and move up um, to where you see roughly, say, what, three species um, in that natural grasslands research. Um, that That's how they move up the curve, and so we know as we add more species, You'll get a little bit less of a return from each species, but we hope to achieve overall a greater number and amount of functions. And so just to give you a bit of a context um, where we're coming from uh, and what kind of situation we're working in, it's um, we're working with winter cover crops in Pennsylvania. You see here, this is a USDA plant hardiness zone map. We're located in the center of Pennsylvania. We're also working on three farms around Pennsylvania. We're ranging from zone six to zone seven, so that's about negative 5 to negative 10 degrees of our uh, minimum temp in the winter. January temperatures of around 20 degrees are average. Um, and so that is a, uh, that causes winter kill in many of the species I'm going to show today, but, but not all, just several that might not winter kill in your area. And so to give you an idea of the, uh, the rotation that we're working in, organic dairy is uh, a large industry in Pennsylvania. And this is a typical rotation that you would see in, in organic dairy and across Pennsylvania. It's a three-year rotation, corn silage, soybean, and winter wheat. And so that gives us two opportunities to plant cover crops, winter cover crops. And so the first opportunity comes after winter wheat, which we'd plant in roughly mid-August. 
and then we'd mold board plow that in mid to early May before we plant our corn. And we also have an opportunity after corn silage harvest, so that's in mid to late September, and then those cover crops will be mold board plowed before we plant our soybeans. Now, obviously those, um, that rotation is not the only one where these cover crops are going to work, and we know that there are many different uh, farms out there, and that these ideas uh, can work in, in many different rotations. And so I just wanted to show you the, the six species that we're going to be uh, talking about today. And this is definitely not exhaustive, but just to get us started on the topic. Um, so on the left, you see our two legumes. Um, this is our red clover and our Austrian winter pea. Now in the right-hand corner of each of these photos, you see the uh, seeding rate per acre and the cost for us per acre. Now the legumes, um, we plant because we want them to fix nitrogen and supply nitrogen to the following cash crop. We chose red clover because we know it'll overwinter here. It's uh, very winter hardy. And we also chose Austrian winter pea. And that was because we know the Austrian winter pea has the opportunity to, it most often will grow and put on more biomass in the fall than the red clover, but it's more susceptible to winter kill. And that just means that in the spring, it might have died through the hard winter, uh, depending on our, how hard the winter is and then how early we plant it. And so the, the second two crops I want to show you, or two species, are uh, canola and forage radish. And so these are both our brassicas, and these will come up a lot through the talk. Uh, the canola is generally winter hardy, very winter hardy, and it's also very important here uh, in mixtures because it's the earliest pollinator uh, resource. It, it flowers earliest out of these six crops, six species, excuse me. And the forage radish, uh, another brassica, this will winter kill here in central Pennsylvania, um, but it's also excellent, like the canola, at scavenging and retaining nitrogen, also at weed suppression. And that brings me to our grasses, uh, which have a similar role. So our cereal rye and our oats here on the right. Um, so these are both also very good at weed suppression and at um, retaining nitrogen. And the cereal rye, we know uh, it's a common cover crop. It's very winter hardy. Um, and the oats, uh, they winter kill here. Uh, but both of them we, know, we knew uh, by adding to our mixtures, um, we would be able to both retain nitrogen and suppress weeds. And so we planted all six of these uh, after wheat in that rotation I just showed you. And that's where these photos are from. We also made uh, four mixtures out of these six species. And I'm going to show you those now. So the three species nitrogen mix that you'll see throughout this talk is abbreviated 3SPPN, just like it shows up here. And the goal we had with this creating this mix was to supply and retain nitrogen. This is primarily uh, for the following cash crop. And so this is primarily made up of um, our two legumes that I showed you on the previous slide. So that's red clover and Austrian winter pea. Both of those are added to the mix at 50% of their monoculture rate. So that's our starting point, to make sure that we're taking care of that first priority, which was to supply nitrogen <clears throat> to the following cash crop. Then we added to that mix cereal rye. We added that at a low rate, at 20% of its monoculture rate. And we did that, if you think back to the guidelines I showed you on the second slide, we want to make sure the grass or brassica is generally in a, in a pretty low rate. Um, and that's just to make sure that uh, because it can be a little more aggressive in the fall that it doesn't, especially in this case where we just have two legumes, it doesn't kind of overtake the entire mix. And so those combine uh, into our three species nitrogen mix. You see here the rate per acre and the, the cost per acre. And then also right above that is the uh, breakdown for each of the species and this, the uh, seeding rate. And here we have our three species weed mix. This will be abbreviated throughout the talk, 3SPPW. The goal here was first to suppress weeds and then second to supply and retain nitrogen. So you see here we added both of our grasses, uh, the cereal rye at 50% of its monoculture rate and the oats also at 50% of their monoculture rate. We knew that these would kind of have the du dual role of um, suppressing weeds because they come on so quickly in the fall but they also uh, do a very good job of scavenging and retaining nitrogen. Now we combine those with the red clover. And so we had hoped here that the red clover would be uh, kind of providing that secondary benefit from this mix 
of supplying nitrogen to the following cash crop. We added that at a 50% rate. These combined into the three species weed mix, which you see here, 127 pounds an acre and about 58 bucks an acre. So that's about $7 more than the three species nitrogen mix. Now I'm going to show you our four species mix, abbreviated for SPP throughout this talk. The goal of this one, it had an, had an added goal from the last two slides and mixes I showed you. Uh, we wanted to make sure we supported pollinators and beneficial insects with this mix. That's what we hope to achieve. So first we added our legumes again, red clover and Austrian winter pea at the 50% rate. That's to help manage and supply nitrogen. Then we add our cereal rye to suppress weeds and again manage nitrogen, again at a low rate of about 20%. And then what's unique about this mix is we added the canola. So this is at a pretty high rate. This is at 50% of its monoculture rate. And this, again, is to support pollinators and beneficial insects. So we know that the canola is going to flower first out of all these species in the spring. And that's why we made sure we had it at a decent rate in this mix. So that comes together. And you see this is, of the four mixes, I'm going to show you our most expensive mix. And that's, again, because we have the canola at a, a relatively high rate. <coughs> And so that comes in at about $77 an acre. Now this is our six species mix. And the idea here was to combine all six species and to think of it as our insurance mix. So this is all six of the species I showed you on that previous slide that we planted in monoculture. We combined them at these rates and got about $70 an acre for the final cost. Now, to bring you back to that slide I showed you before, when you're thinking about agriculture and a lot of our uh, parts of our rotation being at one species, when we moved up to our three species mixes, we, we knew that we would get, or we expected to get, a higher amount of these functions. But with our six species mix, we knew we'd get a little bit less of a, a bang for our buck from each, because as we move up the curve, you get just uh, diminishing returns on, on each species that you add. Um, but we wanted to make sure that, say it was a year where the Austrian winter pea winter kills or, or just a few, few of the species didn't um, really establish like we thought they would, then we knew would still fall uh, a significant way up this curve and be getting a lot, uh, multiple functions from our species in the mix. And so what I'm going to do now is take you through uh, our fall and spring biomass. So what, uh, when, over the last few years, we planted these cover crops mixes and what did we get out in the field. So just to remind you, this is where we're at in our rotation. We're after winter wheat. We're about halfway through the cover crop planting that, that was planted in August and now this is around November. We go, go out and harvest a little bit of the biomass to see what's there. So you see here on the horizontal um, axis you have our six monocultures and then right next to it you have our four mixes. And so in the fall we see a, a, a good mix establishing in those four mixtures, um, with the exception that the red clover just doesn't establish that well in the fall. We knew it would come on a little bit slower because it's a perennial. It might not compete as well against those grasses, um, but this is, uh, it, it showed up less in our mixes, I think, than we expected. And you also notice there, uh, if you compare the red clover and the pea um, bars in the chart, um, the pea uh, shows you how much, how much in the last couple years, it really um, put on as far as biomass in comparison to the red clover, it put on significantly more. And so in the spring, these same cover crops, so the same part of the rotation here, but right before we plant corn silage, they look a bit differently. So we have our six monocultures again on the horizontal axis on the left. You see the oat and the radish winter killed here in central Pennsylvania. And then you see the, the four mixtures on the right. Now, the red clover, those lines are a bit thicker than you saw in the fall, but they still, the mix is very heavily dominated by rye. So in, in our mixtures, that rye seeding rate of around 20% of its monoculture rate really took over. And you still see um, a bit of the pea and the canola, but it's, it's a bit more rye than I think um, you, would, you would really want to have. And so um, what's interesting is we also planted these mixtures at another point in our rotation, after, so you see in the rotation in the top left corner, it moves to right before soybeans. So this is uh, cover crops that were planted after our corn silage. And then we went out and me measured biomass right before the soybean harvest. And um, basically the takeaway here is that rye dominates in all the mixtures. When it's planted, the mixtures are planted late after corn silage. Now, 
one more point that I want uh, to really uh, give you right before I hand off here is um, we planted the same four species mix that I showed you a few slides ago on um, several on, on three farms around Pennsylvania and at our research station. And that mix uh, varied as far as how it grew on each of those farms. And so you see uh, on the left side here, the research station and farm one have slightly shorter seasons, and farm two and three have slightly longer seasons, so more of a zone seven. And on the research station, that four species mix was rye dominated. So that green in the pie chart there is the rye biomass. And you see in, in the research station, the legumes did a little bit better than on farm one. And on farm one, the canola did a little bit better than the legumes. And, and um, on farms two and three, it was a totally uh, different situation. So the canola dominated that same mix, planted in a similar rotation after small grains. Um, and so what's interesting to note is that the research station in farm three, where the legumes did a bit better, there is a low residual amount of nitrogen in the field. So at the research station in farm three, that, that amount of nitrogen available to these mixes was a bit lower than in farms one and two. And so it's interesting to see how the legumes, when there's not much nitrogen around, the legumes do a bit better in the mix than when there is a lot of nitrogen around. When there was a lot of nitrogen around, these two middle mixes, the, uh, the rye and the canola, which are excellent at scavenging for nitrogen, um, seem to dominate uh, a bit more. And so finally, uh, I'm going to hand off here to Mitch, who's going to take you through weed suppression and management. Then we'll hear from Jermaine with beneficial insects and Charlie with nitrogen management. And then I'll return for a couple of wrap-up slides for the Q&A to help answer this question, can mixtures achieve multiple goals on the farm? Thanks. Thanks, Jim. I'll take it over from here. <clears throat> my name is Mitch Hunter. I'm working on my PhD here at Penn State, and I wanted to share with you some of what we've learned here about weed management with cover crop mixtures. Um, so to get started off with our goals, uh, there's a couple main goals that we've focused on here, and the first one is to keep weeds from setting seed. So I'm sure you all know that when you go to plant your cover crops, you're likely to get a flush of weeds coming up along with them. Um, as, you, as you disturb the soil, the weeds are going to germinate. And we just want to make sure that those weeds that come up uh, don't have the opportunity to grow and develop enough that they can actually set seed and drop it back into the soil because, as we all know, that's going to create uh, weed problems further down the line. So we want to have a nice uh, competitive cover crop in place to keep any weeds that do come up um, from becoming a problem as far as uh, rejuvenating the seed bank. Um, the second goal that we have is to grow cover crops, not weeds. And as Jim mentioned, we'll be talking a lot about different functions that you can get from your cover crops here today. Um, so when you've carefully gone through and, and, and made your mix and chosen what functions that you want, you want to make sure that you get those functions, um, not whatever functions the weeds might provide. Um, so having a good cover crop out there that's actually going to keep the weeds down um, and make sure that it's the cover crop growing in your field, not the weeds, uh, is a good way to get the benefits that you paid for when you put together your seed mix and, and plant it in the field. And then finally, kind of a bonus goal that we've started to, thought about, um, started to think about more recently is that you can use your cover crop management as an opportunity to draw down the weed seed bank in your soil. Um, so I'll get to that a little bit more um, towards the end of my portion here. All right, so what questions were we looking at? The first question was just very simply, which cover crops work best? And we just want to straightforwardly look at this from a management perspective. Um, if you're a farmer, organic farmer, trying to incorporate cover crop mixtures and cover crops into your rotation, which ones are going to be most effective for keeping your weeds down? Um, and then to build on that, do the mixtures help? You know, we've heard from a lot of farmers who are interested in using mixtures. Um, you know, so we want to understand if the mixtures actually help get the weed suppression that you need to get or if the, the mixtures maybe have a trade-off uh, where they're not doing as well for, for weed suppression. Um, and then to, to really extend this further, our final question was, how do cover crops suppress weeds? So we wanted to get down to the mechanism of exactly how this works um, so that we can understand the process and be able to, to, to advise people about how they might start thinking about it on their farm. So we can only test a certain number of, of cover crops here in our research and, and with our collaborating farms. Um, but if we can figure out how this process is working, then that's something that people can take home and work with as you, as you fine tune cover crop mixtures on your own farm. So to get down to some of our key results, uh, the first one is that uh, most cover crops did control spring weeds. So that's a nice result to have. And, and to start explaining that, um, you can see on the left side of this graph uh, 
that we have spring weed biomass. So these are the weeds that we went out in the spring and clipped, and we dried them down in the oven so we could get a, an even dry weight basis. Um, and then uh, across the bottom, we have our six uh, monoculture cover crops, and again, our four mixtures. So to put the data up there, um, each one of these boxes represents the range of, of results that we've seen over the two years um, that we have data from. So as you can see, for instance, the, the, in, for the clover cover crop, the range is much wider and also is much higher. So there are more weeds in that um, typically following or, or, or in that cover crop treatment. And then for instance, for the rye or the six species mixture, um, the range is very small and it's very low. So there just weren't very many weeds in those treatments. Um, so again, to get to our conclusions, our results, um, we saw that the mixtures worked about as well as the best monocultures, um, which is very heartening, I think, for people who are interested in going out and using cover crop mixtures on their farm. Um, so to point out um, some comparisons here, you can see that for the oat and the rye as monocultures, the, the weed levels were very low. But then you can see that for the two, three species mixtures, the four species and the six species mixture, um, again, the weed levels were very low, um, maybe a little bit higher in the case of the four species mixture, but not something that you should be concerned about. So I think there's two, two takeaways from this. First, uh, you don't need to have a mixture to get good weed suppression. You can see for the oat and the rye, they were monoculture cover crops and they did a great job on their own. But if you're interested in mixtures, there's an opportunity here to do that, um, to add additional species to get um, additional function, functions maybe adding a legume to get some nitrogen fixation, adding a flowering cover crop to support pollinators. You can actually, what we're showing here is that you can actually do that as long as you've got a couple crops um, or even just one crop in the mixture that's gonna do a good job suppressing weeds in the fall. Um, you can build out from that weed suppressive base and include other species to get other functions. So that's the first result here from the biomass. The second one is that our legumes are really the laggards in terms of weed suppression. So again, to point this out, we've got the clover and the pea. Um, again, the clover just uh, ended up with a lot more weed biomass in the field. And the pea was a bit high, and you can see at the top there had a, a real outlier. Um, so I think there might be some risk with the pea that you just get some, some weedy patches if your establishment isn't as uniform. Um, so, so legumes on their own might not be the best bet in terms of weed suppression. But again, if you look to the right, um, there are legumes included in most of those mixtures, or I think all those mixtures. And so you can include legumes um, in your cover crop mixtures um, as long as they're uh, joined up with another species that's going to give you your weed suppression. And then finally, we saw that the winter killed cover crops can actually work very well as far as uh, supplying weed suppression in the spring. So for the oat and the radish, these are both species that winter kill here at our site in central Pennsylvania. Um, they, so they'll come the first frost, they, they pretty much turn off and, and there's nothing growing there green in the spring, which you might think would open up a big opportunity for weeds to come in. So just to illustrate this, um, here's a picture of a pretty successful fall radish stand that we had. And then by spring, it looked about like this. So it pretty much disintegrates over the winter and you can see a lot of bare ground there that could be an opportunity for weeds to come in and establish and become a problem. But again, we really didn't see that uh, be too much of an issue come spring. And we really think that's because those cover crops have done a good job suppressing the weeds that, that were germinating at that timing when you till the soil and disturb it to get your cover crop in. So that brings us to thinking about, well, exactly how is this happening? And Again, to get to, to some more results, um, you've still got weed biomass on the left side, same as before. And then across the bottom, we have a measure of early fall percent cover. And what we did is, is we went out to the field about five or six weeks after cover crop planting, and we were looking straight down at the field from above. Uh, we used a, a frame to train our eyes, and we estimated the percent of the ground that was covered with cover crops as opposed to being covered with weeds or soil. And that's something that you could definitely do on your farm. Um, and what we saw is that this early fall percent cover measurement was really a great predictor of the spring weed biomass. So to put the data up there, it's really clear that as you get to a higher percent cover in the fall, you're going to have um, a lower, most likely going to have a lower spring weed biomass. And we actually did that measurement at a couple of points um, across the fall. And really, it was that early measurement that did the best job of explaining it. So if you, if you want to get out there and assess your own cover crop stand, I'd recommend going about five or six weeks after cover crop planting um, to get a sense of what's going on. And so we think that the, the, the real mechanism here that explains how these cover crops are suppressing weeds 
is um, they're jumping up out of the ground quick in the fall, covering the ground, and either keeping weeds from germinating or keeping the weeds that do germinate from, from um, progressing and, and growing and, of course, setting seed. So to give you an idea of how this might look, um, here's a picture of one of our successful fall mixtures. Uh, you can see it's, it's a nice mixture, pretty even, and it's doing a great job of, of uh, covering the ground and suppressing weeds. And in contrast, this is how our clover looked one year. Um, much more open canopy, a lot of bare dirt there available for weeds to come in and grow, and not much that the clover is going to do to keep them down. So as a rule of thumb, um, you can kind of draw a line here about 30% cover. And it looks like to the left of that line, you might be getting into some weed problems. And to the right of that line, weeds weren't too much of a problem in, in most cases. So if you can get out there to the field, about five or six weeks after you plant your cover crops and assess percent cover and, and you're doing, uh, you're, you know, you're at 30% or above, you're probably gonna be doing okay in terms of weeds the next spring. Now to the final thing that we've been thinking about, um, how can you use your cover crop management to actually help draw down the weed seed bank? Um, this is an opportunity if you've got a problem weed or two on your farm to really think about trying to get a lot of weeds uh, or of seeds from that weed to germinate and then using your cover crop to suppress them. So um, you need to think about when exactly those weeds are gonna germinate. So what we have here is a chart of uh, weed germination periodicity. So it shows across the top the different times of the year, and then it shows with these figures um, an illustration of when the weeds are gonna, or when the seeds are gonna germinate and how um, intense those germination fluxes will be or in germination pulses would be. So if you're gonna be planting after a small grain, say in late summer, um, you're likely to get a pulse of weeds like lamb's quarter or redroot pigweed that have a germination period that includes that time of year. Um, and if you're planting a little bit later, perhaps after a corn silage, you might get a different set of weeds that are, that are germinating and, um, and coming up with your cover crops. And so what this uh, farmer that we've been speaking with um, nearby here has been doing is actually specifically targeting a couple of problem weeds in their field and then going ahead and planting um, uh, a nice aggressive cover crop of ryegrass, clover, and, and radish, um, and they're having good success with that cover crop um, coming along with those weeds that they want to have germinate, but keeping those weeds from setting seeds. So year by year, um, they're actually drawing down the weed seed bank in their soil. And I wanna emphasize that this is not a short-term strategy that you can do for one year and, and be good. You need to do this for a few years in a row to continually draw down the weed seed bank. All right, so, so to summarize some of the take homes as far as weed management, uh, we've seen that many cover crop treatments can be effective. Uh, you need to watch out for slow growing legumes on their own, um, but if you start from a weed suppressive base of an aggressive grass or brassica and then build out from there, you can include legumes and you can include mixtures and still get good weed suppression. Uh, we saw that winter killed cover crops can suppress weeds through the spring, and that's because they actually get, um, in, in these cases of oat and radish at least, they can get rapid fall growth and keep weeds from coming on in that critical period there after you've planted or, or during the planting of your cover crop. Um, so as long as you get a good stand and cover the ground well, you should be in good shape, um, winter killed or not. And then finally, uh, you can actually manage your tillage timing that like, um, when you're tilling to get your cover crop in, um, you can manage that timing to um, focus on problem weeds, get those seeds to germinate, and then over time, draw down the weed seed bank. That's all I have. I look forward to your questions later on. I'm going to pass it over to Jermaine. Thank you, Mitch. Um, so my name is Jermaine Hines. I'm an uh, entomology graduate student working towards completing my PhD here at Penn State. And so for today, I'll talk about how uh, some of the cover crop mixtures we're using can influence the beneficial insects that show up on our farms. Um, so just to start with a little bit of background, so what do we say when we mean beneficial insects? And beneficial insects are, are simply insects that provide a valuable ecosystem service on our farm. And these can include pollinating insects such as bees, moths, or other beetles that pollinate our crops and can um, increase our, our fruit steps, our fruit uh, sets in, in different crops. Additionally, we have predatory and parasitic insects such as lady beetles or parasitic wasps that can suppress pest insects and keep uh, their levels below economically damaging levels. And just to emphasize how important beneficial insects are, I have some recent estimates of uh, their annual value uh, to agricultural systems each year. Um, so pollinators provide approximately $30 billion in pollination services each year, 
where on the other hand, natural enemies provide an estimated $4.6 billion in pest suppression uh, services each year. And so these are very uh, important insects that, that you might want to consider promoting on your farm. Um, so now I want to talk about insects and how they relate to the plant community and how cover crops would influence uh, what insects show up. And so plants represent a valuable resource to beneficial insects, uh, especially towards bees where they require, require pollen. But in addition, they also are valuable to natural enemies. Um, so you might think as predators is only requiring uh, their prey items, but in fact they rely on uh, cover crops or, or plants for food resources. And these can be provided through nectar, pollen, or alternative uh, prey. And so on the, the top right here, I have a picture of a, a pink spotted lady beetle that's feeding on uh, an aphid prey. Uh, in the middle, we have a lady beetle and a surfid fly or a hoverfly, which are both beneficial insects feeding on uh, nectar from this buckwheat plant. And finally, I have a, 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 a multicolored Asian lady beetle that's covered in pollen. Um, they, they also rely on pollen to, to complete their development. And not only is uh, floral resource or food resources provided by fl uh, flowers important to beneficial insects, but also uh, shelter provided by the vegetation of cover crops can be important as they can provide egg laying sites for different insects such as lady beetles or just a refuge uh, for, for ground dwelling uh, predatory beetles. Um, and so when we're thinking about uh, how, how our cover crop mixtures and our rotations may support um, insects, uh, they can uh, potentially support um, insects, so beneficial insects when their usual prey numbers are, are low. So consider uh, early blooming uh, canola cover cover crop. The early flowering might suppress, uh, might, excuse me, um, support uh, bees or other beneficial insects that are emerging early that may not have their their uh, food items around. And so what we want to think about is, uh, can we use cover crop mixtures to support beneficial insects? And so another thing to consider is, is like, like us humans, insects also it, it exhibit uh, specific food uh, preferences. And these can depend on a variety of, a variety of plant characteristics, uh, mostly floral characteristics, uh, such as uh, shape, size, color, or smell. So here I have uh, six different uh, popular insectary or insect supporting species, including Austrian winter pea, sweet alyssum, buckwheat, canola, uh, white clover and red clover. And you can imagine that different insects might uh, react to these differently. So large insects uh, such as bees or lady beetles might prefer uh, these open flowers provided by canola or buckwheat, whereas um, smaller insects such as parasitic wasps might um, be more attracted to, to the smaller flowers such as, as red clover or white clover. And so uh, we might expect that more diverse mixtures may support a more d diverse group of beneficial insects. And so before considering using um, mixtures to support beneficial insects um, on your farm, you want to consider um, if, if, this, if this goal is important to you and um, how this can fit in with sort of your, with your crop establishment and termination window. And so what I have here is a hypothetical uh, timeline of the growing season here in central Pennsylvania. And what I'm going to do is overlay uh, some of the different cover crop species and their, their uh, peak bloom times. And so here we have cover crop mixtures containing canola. Uh, these will typically flower uh, anywhere from April to mid-May before senescing. Um, uh, mixtures containing red clover are a little bit later. They will see them blooming uh, early May to, through, through July. And later still we have mixtures containing Austrian winter pea, uh, which, which may bloom from uh, June uh, into August. And what, what I'm going to do now is um, uh, show two important predatory insects and their, their uh, times of activity throughout the season. And so first we have the pink spotted lady beetle, which is a very important predator. Those uh, typically emerge in early May and are uh, active throughout the, the, the season. Also, the Mayanute pirate bug is another important predator that's um, important throughout the season. And so one might consider when you're, when you're terminating, one might, might consider your terminate, termination date and how this would influence the, the bloom period of, of different cover crops. And so uh, we might reach um, peak canola, canola bloom before, um, before termination, whereas uh, we might miss peak bloom windows for, for mixtures containing red clover 
or, or Austrian winter pea. And so we might consider uh, in rotations where cover crop mixtures must be terminated before flowering, are there alternative uh, ways to use them to, to promote beneficial insects? And before I, I sort of answer that question, I want to um, consider the example where uh, we use canola as early blooming species. And so um, canola was one of the few species that flowered during our, our cover crop, uh, in our cover crop mixtures during our crop rotations. Um, and so what we did was compare the amount of bees present um, in our canola canola mixtures and, and look at uh, sort of compare that with the, the density of flowers. And so a diverse group of wild bees can visit canola plants and cover crop mixtures. And one of our main findings is that um, there are more frequent bee visits in monoculture plots where floral density was highest. And just to show that data, here we have um, on the bottom axis, uh, there are three different mixtures containing canola. The first is the canola monoculture on the left, uh, four species mix in the middle, and a six species mix containing canola on the right. And on the, the, the left axis, we have just the number of open blooms uh, per quarter meter square. And this is to get an idea of the, the floral density. Um, and so what we're seeing here is canola monocultures have the highest floral density. So there are more flowers uh, per quarter meter square. And we see that the, the number of open blooms per quarter meter square decrease uh, with the more species you, you add um, to more diverse mixes. And to, to think about how bees respond to that, we have similar axes. So on the bottom, we have the monoculture, the four species mix, and the six species mix. On the left-hand side, you have the average number of bee visits per two minutes. And so we can see that um, in monocultures, bees are typically the most active. Um, so that corresponds with sort of the, the number of open uh, canola blooms um, that we've, we've seen when we measured uh, floral density. Uh, four species mix, uh, less bee activity, and uh, there's a significant, significant difference between the six species mix and the monoculture mix in terms of uh, the number of bee visitations uh, per, per two-minute observation. And so uh, what about our natural enemies? Um, so coming back to this question of alternative ways to use um, these insect tree or insects as supporting plants where you're in a rotation that uh, has to be terminated before full bloom is reached, you can implement uh, cover crop mixtures as insectary strips. Uh, so here's some research uh, we're working on to sort of fine tune cover crop mixtures to, to attract uh, varying um, groups of, of beneficial insects. And things you want to think about when um, designing a mixture to promote beneficial insects is the, the, the type of resource available. So I mentioned before that insects have preferences. And so to sort of address this idea of, of complementary resources, uh, I was looking at uh, two rapid summer, two rapid growing summer cover crops. The first is buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat provides many white, white open flowers that could provide nectar and pollen for beneficial insects. On the, have, on the other hand, we have uh, cowpea, which is, a di which is also a, a rapid growing cover crop. This is a legume. Um, it flowers a little bit later in the season, but it does put on these uh, nectar producing glands called extrafloral nectaries that beneficial insects are attracted to. So I want to think about how providing these two species in the, in the mixture uh, would provide complementary resources and if they can potentially uh, attract the wider range of beneficial insects. So this research is currently in progress, so I'll, I'll keep, you, uh, keep you updated. And just a few take-home messages of so what we've been learning uh, with, with some of this research is that it seems like just the presence of, of flowering species uh, as well as uh, high floral density that it seems like that may be more important than cover crop diversity. And so before using some of these cover crop mixtures on, on your farms, you want to consider how compatible they are with, with your farm goals and in, 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 in your following cash crop. And so you want to consider timing. So the establishment of, of, of the cover crop, the peak uh, floral bloom windows, as well as the termination. So you'd want to get those cover crops off, off in time to, to establish your cash crop. Um, and so if, if this goal is incompatible with your overall farm goals, you might want to consider alternative uh, uses of cover crops um, through the use of insectary strips. 
So when considering mixture design, you want to consider a diversity of flower types. So again, insects have different floral preferences depending on um, depending on size, shape, color, and smell. Um, and another one thing you want to consider is that you should be aware of uh, potential crop pests in your system and avoid using cover crops that might exacerbate any pest problems. And so with that, I'll pass it off to Charlie to talk about nutrient retention. Great. Thanks, Jermaine. So my name is Charlie White, and I'm working with the team on measuring some of the nutrient cycling properties and, and soil health properties. So uh, today I wanted to talk primarily about uh, how cover crop mixtures influence nitrogen management. And there's a couple goals that farmers are, are probably most interested in uh, getting out of their cover crop in terms of nitrogen. And the first goal is to prevent nitrate leaching, and we might call this nitrogen retention. And nitrate leaching occurs uh, in, in uh, more humid, wet climates over the winter time when we get an excess of rainfall and nitrate percolates through the subsoil and potentially uh, reaches groundwater where it might become an environmental pollutant. The other goal that farmers are often interested in is using their cover crop to supply nitrogen to their next cash crop and offset the need to purchase fertilizer or to add manures and compost. So the, the way that cover crop mixtures affect these various goals depends a lot on the characteristics of the different species that uh, you might put into the mix. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how some of those characteristics vary. And we'll talk about uh, different species types, whether it's grasses, brassicas, and legumes, how those affect the nitrogen management, as well as whether the uh, species are winter hardy or winter killed. So grasses and brassicas are uh, species of cover crops that can only acquire nitrogen from the soil. They take that nitrogen up through their roots and they can hold it in their biomass uh, over the winter and uh, prevent it from leaching out. Uh, because they can only acquire nitrogen from the soil, they tend to have relatively aggressive ability to scavenge uh, that nitrogen. Legumes, on the other hand, have a special ability to fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere. And they do that through an association with soil microbes that live in root nodules uh, on the plant. Those microbes take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and feed it to the crop. Uh, because legumes have this supply of nitrogen uh, through their microbial association, they're less demanding of the soil nitrogen uh, pool. So they tend to be worse at scavenging nitrogen against leaching. The other characteristic of cover crop species that affects the nitrogen management is whether they're winter hardy or winter killed. And here in this figure you can see on the top we have uh, cereal rye and canola some of the examples we've been talking about today. These are winter hardy species in our climate. Uh, other species that we've been talking about today, oats and forage radish in our climate, tend to winter kill. So uh, over the winter when the temperatures drop below freezing for several weeks at a time, these species die and their residues start to decompose. So here in the bottom pictures you can see uh, oats and forage radish residues that have winter killed and are starting to decompose. So here we have some data uh, from, from one of our experiments where we measured nitrate leaching uh, under the cover crops. And we measured this leaching at 12 inches depth, so we monitored how much nitrate moved below 12 inches into the subsoil. And on the, the y-axis here you can see where we have pounds nitrogen per acre leached below 12 inches, and then different cover crop types and mixtures along the bottom of the figure. So these um, species and mixtures fell out into different groups. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the cover crop type that allowed the most amount of leaching was either where you had no cover crop or the slow growing legume clover. And just to put this into perspective, this is 100 pounds of nitrogen that's moved into the subsoil. And if you were to go out and purchase organic fertilizer, 100 uh, pounds equivalent would be quite expensive. So allowing this, these nutrients to move into the subsoil uh, where you might not be able to access them is a pretty significant economic consideration as well. In the middle we had a group of species that uh, were moderate, moderately able to reduce nitrate leaching and these species, tend, species tended to either be a fast-growing legume, the pea, or winter-killed species, oat and radish. Uh, 
And to give you an example of comparing the clover and the pea here, uh, we already talked about how the pea is a much faster grower in the fall. And because it grows so fast, it does actually put a little bit of a demand on the soil nitrogen pool, and we saw that it reduced leaching a moderate amount, whereas the red clover didn't do very much at all to reduce leaching. The last group of, of species or mixtures uh, that were the best at reducing, reducing nitrate leaching, they reduced it by 90 to 95 percent, all included either a winter hardy grass or a brassica. And just to revisit the seeding rates of grasses and brassicas in some of these mixes, our three species nitrogen mix had a 20 percent seeding rate of rye. Our six species mix had a 20 percent of rye and 25 percent of canola. Our four species mix had 20 percent of rye and 50 percent of canola. And our three species weed mix had 50 percent rye. So even with only having a 20 percent seeding rate, of the, of the cereal grass, for example, in our three species nitrogen mix, we are still able to reduce nitrate leaching by 90 percent. In some of our on-farm work, we had the opportunity to measure nitrate leaching uh, under a frost-seeded red clover cover crop. And in the bottom pictures here, you see our farmer collaborator combining his spelt field here. And underneath the spelt, you can see the, the frost-seeded red clover growing. And here it is with, you can see the straw windrow there. So that, that red clover uh, continues to grow through the rest of the fall and into the spring. And when we measured uh, nitrate leaching under this red clover, we saw that uh, we lost about 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre compared to where we had our four species mix. This is the same four species mix here. Uh, we only saw about five pounds of nitrogen leaching. So again, the red clover, even though it was frost seeded and was producing a vigorous amount of biomass, allowed uh, a good bit of nitrogen leaching. Now we had a three species clover mix at this site as well, red clover, ladino clover, and sweet clover. And this was seeded in the summertime, the soil was tilled up, and uh, it became invaded by weeds. So in the pictures down here, you see the frost seeded red clover, which was nearly weed free, and that summer seeded three species mix had a pretty severe weed invasion, uh, similar to the type of weed invasions Mitch talked about occurring in a red clover monoculture seeded in the summertime. But what we observed is that, that those weeds took up about 40 pounds nitrogen per acre, and that's the same amount of leaching reduction we saw uh, in that three species mix compared to the red clover. So this was a case where the weeds might have actually played uh, an ecological service in terms of retaining nitrogen and preventing leaching. So the other goal that we talked about uh, with nitrogen is nitrogen supply to the next cash crop. And this occurs during the summertime after the cover crops have been killed and are incorporated into the soil and microbes begin to break them down. And, and an important characteristic of the cover crop that dictates how much nitrogen will become available during decomposition is called the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And this is simply the uh, percent of carbon divided by the percent nitrogen in the tissue. And it tends to be on a scale uh, from anywhere from 5 to 1 to 40 to 1 in terms of cover crop tissue. And on the left side of the scale here with low C to N ratios, that means we have a very high nitrogen concentration in the cover crop biomass. On the right hand side of the scale uh, at 40 to 1, we have a very low nitrogen concentration in the cover crop biomass. And when we have a high nitrogen concentration and a low C to N ratio, as those cover crops decompose, the microbes have excess nitrogen in the cover crop tissue more than they need, and that excess nitrogen is released into the soil. And that process is called nitrogen mineralization. On the other hand, when you have a low nitrogen concentration cover crop residue, as the microbes decompose that residue, they don't get enough nitrogen from the, the cover crop residue and they need, to take ex they need to take nitrogen from the soil in order to break down that residue. So this is a case where the microbes are tying up nitrogen from the soil, and we call that nitrogen immobilization. In the middle of the spectrum here, at around 20 to 25 to 1 of C to N ratio, is sort of a neutral ground where the microbes have just enough uh, nitrogen in the cover crop residue for them to decompose it, but there's neither excess remaining uh, to be released into the soil, nor do they need to take any out of the soil to break that residue down. 
So how do our different cover crop species fall on the scale of C to N ratio? Our legumes, the clovers and the peas, tend to have a low C to N ratio, usually around 10 to 1. Brassicas, radish, and canola, uh, the radish can be, tends to be lower, between 10 and 15 to 1. Canola, on the other hand, uh, can uh, fall in a wide range of C to N ratios. If it's killed when it's young, or if it's growing in a field with an ample amount of nitrogen supply, its C to N ratio will tend to fall on the lower end of the scale, maybe between 10 to 1 and 15 to 1. Uh, on the other hand, if it's uh, low nitrogen soil or it's mature when it's killed, its C to N ratio might get as high as 30. Our grasses also can have a wide range depending on when they're killed and the nitrogen supply. When they're young, they might be as low as 10 to 1, but oftentimes cereal rye can get as high as 40, when it's killed. If you see seed heads coming out of your cereal rye, its C to N ratio is probably around 40 to 1. Our winter killed species, oats and sorghum Sudan grass, also tend to have high C to N ratios as well. So by building a mix, with including these different species, what we found is that we end up with a composite C to N ratio that also ends up somewhere in the middle. In our research station mixtures, the, one that we've most, the ones we've mostly been talking about today, the C to N ratio is ranged from about 20 to 1 to 40 to 1, and that's dependent on how much rye has been in the mixture. Our on-farm mixtures, where we've had greater amount of nitrogen availability, intended to have less rye in the mixes, we've seen C to N ratios between 15 to 1 and 20 to 1. So the C to N ratio really affected our corn yields, and this figure here shows you the, the yields of our corn silage crop and then the different cover crop species uh, along the bottom axis. And we can draw a line here at our fallow uh, treatment. And uh, species that, or cover crops that fell below the fallow treatment tended to have higher C to N ratios. So you can see here uh, our four species mix, three species nitrogen mix, six species mix, uh, tended to have C to N ratios around 27 to 28. And as we increased the seeding rate of rye in the mixes, we moved up to around 39 to 40. Uh, the mixes that did better than our fallow tended to have low C to N ratios. So the pea and the clover had C to N ratios of 10 or 12. So uh, this data um, indicates that there might be important trade-offs between our goals of nitrogen retention and nitrogen supply. Species on the left here, um, showed higher corn yields, but they allowed a moderate amount of nitrogen leaching. On the right, we have species that prevented, did a good job of preventing nitrogen leaching, but they lowered corn yields. The one species that doesn't fit that trend is oat, because it didn't do a great job of pre preventing nitrogen leaching. So you can see that these tend to be a lot of monocultures uh, that show these trade-offs. In the middle here, a number of our mixtures showed what you might consider to be an acceptable compromise. They did an excellent job of preventing nitrogen leaching, but they didn't hurt the corn yield too much compared to some of the other cover crops. And this is a case where when you grow these mixtures, you may need to add a little bit extra nitrogen fertility on your corn crop to meet your maximum yield. So uh, from this, we concluded um, a quick uh, take-home message uh, to balance nitrogen retention and supply combine a well-adapted legume with a low seeding rate of a winter hardy grass or brassica. So I'd like to turn over to turn back over to Jim now and he's going to conclude and then we can take some questions. Great, thanks Charlie. And so I'm just going to wrap up with a couple slides here and uh, first off we want to try to answer um, that central question can mixtures achieve multiple goals? And so from what we've seen today, I think we can say yes, but we need to make a plan beforehand. So we're going to revisit our guidelines first, thinking about when you're putting together a mixture and you want to manage weeds. As Mitch said, you want to make sure you have one to two species that provide fast ground cover in the fall, and then you can start thinking about adding other species to the mix for other goals that you might have. Um, thinking back to what Jermaine spoke to us about, um, to support beneficial insects for pollination or biological control, manage mixtures to include flowers. So think about canola we showed you today is maybe the first one to um, 
to flower for us here in our mixes. Um, think about what might work for your rotation and then go from there. And for nitrogen, um, this is what Charlie just wrapped up with. Uh, combine a well-adapted legume with a low seeding rate of a winter hardy grass or brassica. Uh, if you think back to what I showed you earlier with our biomass and how our mixtures kind of shook out, um, our rye at about 20% 20% of the monoculture rate seem to take over in some of our mixtures in the spring, so just be aware of that as you start to put together your mixes. And so that brings us to the overall guideline. Um, aim for balanced biomass, so aim for evenness in your mix um, from all the species uh, to make sure you benefit from all the potential functions. And so to make the most of these mixtures on your farm, um, first think about what functions it is that, that you want to get from your cover crop mixture. And so this list is not exhaustive, but these are a few things that you might want to try to be uh, working with on your farm. And, and so you can think about species that, might, uh, that you learned about today that might help you with each of these functions. And then you can whittle down that list uh, to once you identify the planting window. So if you're planting in late summer, your list might be a bit longer than if you're planting in late, late fall. And so a couple good resources uh, when you start thinking about species that you want to work with in your mix would be um, a book like the SARE publication, Managing Cover Crops Profitably, which you can find online for free. Or we also have uh, an ex extension uh, fact sheet coming out soon that might be helpful to look at. And that will be posted on our website, a uh, link to which is on the next page, uh, sometime in the near future. So finally, um, once you identify those species that you want to work with and put it in your mix, uh, you have to think about fine tuning for an even mixture on your farm. As I showed you on an earlier slide, um, the same four species mix performed very differently depending on how long the season was on a certain farm and what type of nitrogen was available in the field. And so expect that that could happen with your mixes and it might take a little while to shake out and kind of figure out what's the best mix for your farm. So rather than me try to tell you now what the best mix is for you to put together on your farm, I'd like to transition to the Q&A session. Um, and so first, I'd like to thank you for joining us and make sure we thank our entire project team and our funding agencies here. Uh, you'll see my contact info at the bottom of this page and a link to our website um, with more information on what you heard about today. And then I think with that we should transition to uh, questions for the panel. And so this is who you have in the room here now to answer any of your questions that might have come up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. Um, we're about to begin our question and answer session, as Jim just said. Um, and for anyone who missed the beginning of the presentation, um, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and hit return. And if you don't see the question box, um, you can click the small plus sign next to the word question, and that will open it up. Um, I also wanted to mention that we really value your feedback, so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out the follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email later today. And um, for those of you who want to go back and um, revisit what you just learned, um, a lot of information, um, this webinar is being recorded, and you'll be able to find the recording on our website um, in the coming week on, um, if you just Google webinars by eOrganic, um, you'll find all of our upcoming and archived webinars, and um, this one will be there as well. So um, if also after the webinar you have additional questions about um, organic farming that aren't directly related to this topic, um, you're also welcome to use um, eExtensions Ask an Expert service, and I'll put a link to that up in a moment. Um, but right now, um, let's move on to your questions. We have um, a couple of questions about um, tillage and um, whether you would recommend any cover crop mixtures um, that would work well for reduced tillage or um, no-till farming. Okay, um, so this is Charlie White and uh, we do have a number of people in the in the room here who are working on some reduced tillage projects. Um, there's a couple ways to go about doing reduced tillage in organic systems. Um, one method is to uh, look to have a winter killed cover crop that you don't need to use tillage to kill. Um, that's one strategy. The other strategy is to, tr to have a winter hardy cover crop that you kill in a method uh, without tillage. And for winter hardy cover crops, the two ways to kill them without tillage, one is to use a roller crimper, uh, which is simply a, a big heavy drum mounted on the front of a tractor and it's got these crimping blades that roll over the cover crop and crimp the stems and kill them. Uh, the other way is to use a flail mower to kill the to kill the winter hardy cover crop. Um, so 
uh, species that you can kill with a, a roller crimper, the most common ones that are used are uh, rye or hairy vetch or, or sometimes triticale. Um, oftentimes it's a mix of triticale and hairy vetch uh, or rye and hairy vetch. Um, species that winter kill that you can no-till into, uh, radish is one species, um, oats also offer another opportunity. Uh, a lot of what you do depends on the context of your crop rotation, so uh, what, 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 what will be your following crop? So for example, if you want to try no-till into soybeans, uh, a good option or, or maybe the best option might be uh, rye rolled down with the roller crimper and then no-till soybeans into it. Um, there's been work done uh, no-tilling spinach uh, early in the spring into a winter killed forage radish and the nitrogen availability from the forage radish as it decomposes tends to uh, boost the spinach growth. So it's an interesting area. There's a lot of work being done on it. Um, kind of complicated to give a, a straightforward answer in a short period of time. Does anyone else want to contribute? Interesting. Yeah, the, another another thing that's uh, you know where there's quite a bit of interest and in, and in some farmers doing this and research going on both on farm and on research station, I think across the country is in the area of rotational tillage. So this would be the idea that uh, perhaps every other year you no you're no tilling or maybe working the soil to get the cover crop in the ground. And then, as Charlie said, not tilling when the following annual crop is seeded the following spring. And uh, with the picking up the weed control with some sort of high residue cultivator in June or early July. Uh, and then often then tilling the following year going into the next crop to break any perennial weed life cycles and, and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. Um, do we, um, okay, we had a couple questions on um, when the cover crops um, were seeded. Um, were they all seeded in August? So most of the, um, this is Jim Lachance again, so most of the cover crops I showed you uh, were photos that were seeded in mid-August. Um, we varied our planting date uh, by a bit each, each year, but um, mid to late August in general, and that's after the, that winter wheat harvest. Okay, and one more timing question. Um, someone wanted to know when corn silage is planted and harvested in Pennsylvania. Sure, so we planted our corn this year at the end of May and we harvested it at the end of September. I think those were both right around the 30th of each month. And so we're also planting these mixes after uh, the corn silage and then we see. So that was uh, something that I showed briefly um, how our mixtures that we planted after the corn silage um, are, are, so that's planted in early October, late September, early October. Um, those are the ones that I showed that in the spring are uh, really heavily, heavily dominated by rye. Okay, um, here's a question. Can you explain the rationale for seeding mixtures at often 50% for each species, even when those add up to 150% and greater? For example, 50% rye and oats would equal at least 100% of a rye in terms of fall growth leaving little room for other species to compete? I think that was in part two. Okay, so so this is Charlie. So that's a great question um, because uh, as, as the person asked or, or mentioned, there was a lot of rye domination. Um, and so when we developed these seeding rates, um, what we thought was that uh, the species are filling uh, different roles um, and they might have different growth windows and they might have different uh, ways to get nutrients out of the soil and so they were complementary to each other and so we thought that maybe the seeding rates um, when you added them all up you know might exceed uh, you know the, the monoculture rate um, so you know 50% plus 50% plus 30% um, 130% there so I think one of the next steps in terms of fine-tuning cover crops is understanding what should be the right seeding rate and I think maybe in some of our mixtures the seeding rates um, might have been a little too high and, and led to some of that domination by the rye. Uh, 
Um, so I would encourage folks to um, experiment and maybe uh, you know vary the seeding rates of mixes, plant some strips on your farm, see how things turn out. Uh, as Jim mentioned, things can also vary a lot based on the weather or um, the nutrient availability. And so if you're in a situation where you know a couple species don't do well, you may want to have a higher rate of, of other species available. So it's something that I don't think we understand fully, but it's, it's an interesting area for more work to be done. Okay, another question. Um, residual nitrogen in fall will have great effect on the grass broadleaf biomass accumulation in fall. Um, do you have any comments on that with respect to your results? Uh, sure. So Jim showed those slides of the four different farms and nitrogen availability really did influence um, the amount of uh, canola and rye that we saw in the mixes. Um, one of the things that's, that, that I think is interesting, that we think is interesting, is that um, a mix might be able to adapt itself to different soil fertility conditions. So in soils that have a lot of extra nitrogen in a mix, you'll get the grasses or brassicas dominating and doing the job that needs to be done of retaining that nitrogen. In a low fertility soil, uh, the grasses and brassicas won't do as well and you'll get more legumes in the stand. And in a soil like that, you probably need more legumes, legumes in the stand. So uh, you may be in a situation often where you don't know exactly how much nitrogen is left in your soil profile uh, at the time you count or at the time you plant the cover crop. So a mix um, may adapt itself to the conditions that present themselves. So that's sort of an interesting feature. Okay. Um, here's a very practical question. What is the best way to mix multiple seed species? Um, plant each species separately or mix them all together? Uh, okay. So, um, Charlie, again, <laughs> we're kind of looking around trying to see who wants to answer these. So, all right, I'm jumping in here. <laughs> Um, okay, so there's a couple of different ways to mix species together, and um, uh, one strategy is to just mix all the species together and put them into the, the box of your grain drill um, and set the depth of the grain drill to about three quarters inch, which is sort of a middle ground for the different species, and then just plant away. Um, you can also separate your seeds into large seeded species and small seeded, seeded species. And if you have a grain drill with two boxes, you can put the small seeds in the small seed box and the large seeds in the large seed box. Um, and sometimes you can even set the small seed box uh, to just dribble seed on the soil surface. And so that way it gets planted um, shallower than the larger seeded species. Um, there are also several um, companies that sell pre-mixed um, seeds so that you don't have to do the mixing yourself. So uh, you can talk to the, the seed companies that you're buying your cover crop seed from and see what they have pre-mixed. Um, and there's even a few places online where you can go and you can create your own custom mix and they'll um, ship it to you in big totes. And so that takes a lot of the work out of it. You just click away on their website and say you want so many pounds of this species, so many pounds of that species. Um, I don't know to what extent um, that company offers organic seed. Um, one of the things to mention is all the prices we listed uh, here um, were for organic seed that we purchased. Um, so that's something to consider. Okay, um, here's someone who lives on the central coast of California, which has um, a very mild winter with little or no frost. Um, do you know um, where people can get recommended cover crop mix recommendations for uh, milder winter areas? Uh, this is Mitch. I just um, I don't have a name to give to you, but what I recommend is starting out with um, either local seed companies that are providing cover crop seed mixes or cover crop seeds, or a local um, county extension agent, or even trying to get in touch with somebody at the UC system who's studying cover crops. I know there are people in UC who are who are studying cover crops, and I'm sure that they would have good recommendations for you. Hey. Um, what kinds of soils were you working with? Um, this also plays a great deal into the end result. These are uh, soils that are developed on limestone. They're very fertile and they're silt loam texture in the, at the surface. Um, the organic 
organic matter ranged a lot among the sites that we showed you. Um, so from moderate levels like 2% up to 4% uh, across the sites that we showed you. Is that any other details in specific that you're interested in? It doesn't say. Um, let's see, here's a question about how, um, wondering why fallow outperformed the mixes for yields on the corn silage. I think that's an, the answer to that is related to the nitrogen availability. And in some of the mixtures, the rye um, with its wide C to N ratio and a lot of biomass, we believe it tied up uh, more nitrogen than we wanted. And so in the fallow field, it didn't, didn't have the rye. There was perhaps more nitrogen available uh, there. So it's a, it's a cautionary tale to make sure that, that the grass doesn't um, tie up too much nitrogen. And you can prevent that from happening both by having a lower seeding rate of the grass, but also by, by killing it earlier. We've started killing our rye uh, earlier um, before it gets to the boot stage and it has a lower C to N ratio at that time. So there's a couple of ways to make sure the grass doesn't tie up too much nitrogen. Okay, um, this person is looking for some um, conclusion here. Going back to the ecological theory graph, um, your results suggest that mixture did not improve any single function over the best monocultures, but that they would provide a greater number of functions, but at reduced effectiveness for any one function than monocultures. So does this support your hypothesis about mixtures? They're looking for a dis discussion of the point about um, whether mixtures provide a greater number of functions um, but yeah. at reduced effect effectiveness for any one function. Yeah, I think there was evidence for that uh, in our data. For example, it, it's true that a monoculture can provide weed suppression um, just as well as any of the mixtures, but some of those mixtures um, retain nitrogen and provided nitrogen to the cash crops in a way that's, that some of the monocultures couldn't. So in the mixtures, we, we saw trade-offs, right? The mixtures didn't they, they may, may not have been the very best nitrogen provider or the very best weed suppressor, but, um, but they could do those things well, and they could do several things well. And so if, if you want to manage for one function, you know, if you want to manage for nitrogen supply, for example, yeah, a legume monoculture is, might be the best thing. But if you want to ma manage for several functions simultaneously, the, the mixtures appear to do that. If they're well-designed, uh, meaning... Uh, you end up getting a balanced biomass of all the species that you add. We find that sometimes it, it, you might plant out a mixture, like after our corn silage, we planted out mixtures and it ended up being a rye monoculture just because the, of the time we planted. And if you, if you do that, then the mixture ends up behaving like a rye monoculture in the mixture. Does anyone want to add to what I just said? I, I had a, just a thought to the, another thing that is important for you know, all of us to think about um, is that, uh, you know, this is two or three years of data. The other thing we would expect with um, greater diversity would be the ability of that um, diverse stand to buffer against the kind of variation in, let's say, a droughty period or multiple droughts, uh, um, unpredictable freezes, et cetera, that come along with any growing season. We would expect more diversity to buffer that variation than monoculture in general. Um, and I, we, I would say we would think that it's too short for us to see that kind of, uh, you know, to understand that kind of resolution in, in two or three field seasons. Okay. Um, we have a couple of um, comments and questions related to insects here. Um, the comment is that um, honeybees exhibit fidelity to the first flowers that they visit, and canola is among the first to flower in the springtime. And then um, there's a question about um, asking what you think of mustard as a cover crop for insects. Right. Our, our person who did the uh, pollination work is not here. One thing I can comment I can make about the uh, canola is that we had a very broad array of bee, wild bee species using that. I think about 36 species. So it was a very good resource for uh, early season resource for pollinators. Now, and we were concerned mostly with that um, pre-termination period. So I'm not sure um, what resources that wide array of pollinators goes on to visit after the canola is managed. 
and as far as mustard, we didn't have that in our um, any of our mixes, and so I can't really speak to that. Okay. Um, speaking of not included um, legume or cover crops, um, this person couldn't help but notice that your legume components didn't include hairy vetch. Is there a reason for this? Um, perhaps the seed cost? Hairy vetch might have done very well in, in our mixtures. Uh, probably would have done better than clover, for example. Um, but uh, we understand that a lot of farmers, a lot of organic farmers, are not using hairy vetch. And so we wanted uh, our, our mixtures were um, informed by our farmer advisory group. And some, one of the things we learned from them was that hairy vetch might not be as popular as some of the others. And, and the, reason, the reason for that, the principal reason for that, is the potential for hairy vetch to become a weed in um, particularly small grains. So our rotations would uh, often, this well in this experiment as well, but in this region, would, would almost certainly have a small grain in it. And the hard-seeded nature of hairy vetch and the challenge in killing hairy vetch organically at the end of the season can often result in some flowering and some pod set with viable seed forming a basically a hairy vetch seed bank. And, and so we've tended to watch out for that uh, in the design of experts as our advisory board, which has farmers from the area have um, given us input that you know, that would be something they'd be quite concerned about incorporating in the rotation. So my name is Eric Rank, and I'm part of an organic farm in central Pennsylvania. We farm close to 1,000 acres organically uh, and close to about 250 acres of corn every year. Cover crops are a very important part of our rotation. And one thing we found with hairy vetch is that oftentimes you don't get a lot of nitrogen until from the biomass until about the 15th of May, which is typically when we want to be planting our corn. And our strategy is to work the soil about two weeks before we plant our corn so that we get that first flush of weeds and the soil warms up. And then when we come back to plant our corn, um, it's a lot easier to manage the soil with tine weeding, rotary hoe, and we don't get that flush of weeds. Um, and so because of that, hairy vetch um, doesn't always suit a rotation very well. Now, having said that, uh, there is a new variety of hairy vetch called Purple Bounty, which is said to be uh, maturing a, a week earlier. Um, so if you would be considering that as a corn farmer, um, that would be something to consider. Okay. Um, speaking of potentially invasive um, plants, when allowed to flower, did canola reappear as an unwanted volunteer, or was it terminated before seed maturation? Yeah, in our, in our particular fields it didn't, but there are some adjacent uh, fields on the research farm and what you've described uh, has happened on, on those fields. So it is a concern, but um, I think if it's terminated in a timely way, you can avoid it. Okay. Um, over the course of the study, did you see a significant drop off in weed production or did it drop off a little bit and then even out when using the mixtures? This is Mitch again. Um, I would say that we haven't seen uh, kind of long-term trends in weed, weed biomass. We've seen some trends that are tied to year-to-year -year variation, um, largely due to differences in moisture in the, the two falls when we planted the cover crops. Um, the first fall, we had plenty of moisture, so the cover crops got going well and really kept the weeds down. The second fall was a bit drier, the cover crops were held back, and the weeds got going. Um, we've seen, so, so again, the, the weed, um, changes over time have been more due to uh, both the weather and then within our cash crops they've been due to our ability to, to get really effective weed management in the springtime with the tine weed or the rotary hoe and the cultivator. Um, what we have seen is a couple of times uh, when we've been unable to get good control during our cash crop window rather than during our cover crop window. Uh, for instance when we've um, the timing of our tillage hasn't worked out well with the timing of our scientific sampling um, or when the soil hasn't worked in the ways that we've wanted it to, we've seen that the following year there, there ends up being another big flush of weeds in those same locations where we had weed problems the year before. So it's definitely the case that um, you know, weed problems can, can kind of cascade down through the years. But again, we've seen that more in terms of um, the, the cash crop weed problems than we have in the cover crop weeds. Let's see. We have a couple questions about um, how one might adapt 
um, this to a small scale mixed vegetable farm, um, for instance, when they're over in, overwintering crops such as um, onions and garlic as well. Yeah, there there are a number a number of us here, and I'm sure a number of folks listening online that are um, you know, working on farmers' places um, where systems very similar to what we described here are being used in diverse um, vegetable cropping systems. Um, I'm thinking of one in particular uh, where um, where the um, seed are cover crop seed are spun on with a spinner in front of a small cultivator and the cover crop seed are basically incorporated by a small veg crops cultivator maybe a two row cultivator an LSG or or some other smaller tractor like that where the cover crops then are um, th those growers those folks are addressing the window to get the cover crop seeds going um, by applying them at the, the you know, lay by the last cultivation as they're going through the field. And those cover crops then will grow up in, um, in fact, we were just on a farm a couple of weeks ago where those, those cover crops are growing up in an overwintering catch crop like, um, uh, what, what would, what might those be? Well, certainly it could be, it could be onions or leeks, but it also, or else what were we seeing? We were seeing this in um, inter-row spaces of overwintering crops planted on plastic like strawberries or other things. So um, so it, 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 it's entirely adaptable, I, I would say. Um, the windows changed depending on vegetable crop and the scale of the equipment would change, but, uh, but it's being used here fairly commonly, the mixtures that is in cover crops over winter. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, we have a lot of people on, so um, we probably can't get to everyone's question. In fact, I know we can't, um, but please do um, use the resources that we posted in the PDF as well as um, some other ones. I sent the link in the chat box, the eExtension Ask an Expert service, and the presenters have nicely provided their contact information, so um, hopefully you'll be able to find the answers. Um, but anyway, this is the last question. Um, Northwestern Washington has very wet winters with relatively mild temperatures, um, about 35 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit. What winter cover crops might you recommend for a region with very wet soils and cold but seldom freezing um, or freezing for very short period um, soils? Growers struggle um, with trying to get fields prepared in a wet, in wet, cool spring. So adding the issue of dealing with cover crop incorporation and preparing ground for planting cash crops is a struggle. I think you've stumped us all here, um, <laughs> but I'll give it a shot. Uh, this is Mitch again, and a couple of thoughts, and then I want to make sure other people chime in because this is certainly not an area of expertise. But um, if you're concerned about the erosion potential during a wet winter, then I think Again, focusing on something that's going to give you good ground cover will be important. Um, something like rye or a canola, uh, aggressive brassica that will persist through the winter will at least keep your soil in place, which is, of course, a very important goal. But that seems to cut against your other goal of being able to take care of that cover crop easily in the spring when the soils are cool and wet. Um, so you might want to consider a mixture with uh, maybe something like an oat, I'm not sure if that would winter kill in your um, your coldest days in the winter of Western Washington. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, if it did, it would certainly ease control in the spring. Um, and if you mix that with something like um, a red clover that would not be putting on as much biomass in the spring, again, that might ease your problems with dealing with the residue. Um, these are just a couple of ideas off the top of my head. I'm gonna hand it off here in case anybody else in the room um, has another suggestion. Uh, you know, this is Dave Mortensen. There, there are. Um, we're involved in another project where um, folks from Michigan and Minnesota, and and other states, including Pennsylvania, are trying to see how to make cover crops work uh, across a range of tillage practices. And it's interesting in the in the cold northern states like Minnesota and Michigan. Uh, where, the, of course, the winters are more extreme, but they have the same problem in the springtime as the Washington folks asking this question, which is cold, wet soils that are difficult to get in because of limited working days to get the groundwork. Um, they're, they're finding that uh, certain tillage practices, um, 
that that fill the raised bed, and one of those is something called ridge tillage, um, it makes it possible actually to, to get cover crops growing, scalp the ridge top, and then get the the cash crop planted earlier in the springtime, where on flat ground it would not be possible for them to get the, the crop planted perhaps for another two to four weeks. Um, and that, that ridge then, which would be made, formed with an aggressive cultivator with ridging wings, um, is one option. I don't know that many people have those. I know when I used to work in Nebraska, about half of the growers had ridging cultivation equipment. It was a very common practice. I believe it's become less common maybe it returns uh, in popularity with um, adopting cover crops on cold, wet soils in the springtime. Okay, well, thank you. We are running out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for their questions and also thank the entire um, Penn State Cover Crop Mixtures research team and participating farmers um, for giving this webinar. And I'd like to mention once again that you'll be able to find um, our many other upcoming and archived webinars um, by Googling webinars by eOrganic. And um, we would also very much appreciate it if you could fill out the follow-up survey that you'll be receiving in an email later today. So um, thanks to all the presenters and um, thanks everyone for joining us.